So hi everyone, uh, it's a pleasure to have Natasha visiting us today. Uh, so Natasha holds a joint position as a senior research scientist at Google Brain and a postdoc at UC Berkeley. Uh, her research is focused on social reinforcement learning in multi-agent and human AI interactions. Uh, Natasha completed her PhD at MIT, where her thesis received the Outstand Outstanding PhD Dissertation Award uh, from the Association for the Advancement of Effective Computing. Uh, her work has also won a ridiculous number of awards at uh, NeurIPS, uh, at ICML, the IEEE Transactions on Effective Computing, and she's an absolute leader in the field of multi-agent RL and human AI interaction. And it's a real pleasure to have us uh, have her join us today to tell us a bit about her work. Uh, so yeah, take it away, Natasha. Thank you so much, Abhishek. I'm so excited to be here. So let's dive straight in. Today, I'm going to be talking about social reinforcement learning. So if I think about the type of applications that motivate my research, I like to think about trying to build an AI assistant that could help us with a bunch of everyday tasks. So it could be in our kitchen with us, helping us prepare a meal. It could do complex tasks like helping us manage our calendar and it could drive us to work. And if you think about such an agent and the current state of the art in AI, what abilities are we lacking that we would need to enable this agent? Well, if it's gonna drive us to work, one thing it needs to do is be able to coordinate with other agents and coordinate with us in shared spaces. But if you look at the current state of the art in multi-agent coordination, you can see that there are still some issues. For example, in this DARPA robotics challenge, um, these robots are having a little trouble coordinating and ooh, yeah, um, they actually lost that drone as a result of a coordination failure here. So you can see that this is still an issue. Another thing we might want is um, to be able to learn from humans in naturalistic ways. So wouldn't it be cool if our Roomba could understand our you know, pointing gestures or understand natural language commands? But the way that we interact with AI systems today still looks a little bit more like this, where we're manually indicating our preferences by pressing buttons or filling out cards. And then finally, if we want an agent that can do things like help us prepare recipes, we're gonna need improvements in the fundamental skills of learning complex skills. So being able to do long horizon planning and decision-making over a sequence of complex subtasks. And we're also gonna to need to make improvements in generalization. So ideally we'd wanna be able to train our agent in simulation and deploy it to everyone's home. But if we look at the current state of the art in generalization, it looks a little bit more like this where we train in this one Atari game on the left and just slightly tweak the colors and the agent actually fails to generalize to the slightly tweaked version. So we need fundamental improvements in learning and generalization. And what I'd like to claim is that social learning can actually help address all of these desiderata. So it might be obvious to you why social learning can help with a social problem like coordination or learning from human feedback. But I think social learning can actually help us make progress on fundamental issues like learning and generalization. Now, obviously, this is not the only area where we need progress. We need progress in perception, manipulation, and many others. But my research is focused on this idea of social learning. So what do I mean by social learning? I mean learning from other intelligent agents that exist in your environment. So you can think about it. If you're an autonomous car, you're on the road, and you encounter an unexpected situation, the other cars are a valuable source of information about what you should be doing. So how can you actually learn from that source of information? And social learning is actually an incredibly powerful learning mechanism, and it's ubiquitous in the human and animal kingdom. So even this little one-inch fish is able to use social learning to generalize effectively to dangerous new environments by taking cues from where other fish are gathering. And in the UK, there's this example of birds learning to open milk top bottles, not because each bird independently discovered this behavior, but because they learn by observing other birds. And many authors have argued that the key differentiator that humans have, what really sets us apart from animals, is actually our social learning abilities. And these are what has given, given rise to our impressive cognitive, cultural, and technological development. So social learning can accelerate learning. While individual learning can be unsafe, error-prone, and time-consuming, social learning can enable you to stand on the shoulders of giants. And so I'd like to ask how social reinforcement learning can improve um, learning from multi-agent interactions, where you're actually learning from other AI agents, and learning from human AI interactions. So my work is pretty broad. It spans this gamut from the more human AI side, where I focused on using machine learning to detect human social and affective cues, Assuming you can detect those cues, how do you actually learn from them and learn from human AI interaction? How do you coordinate with other agents or learn from other agents in a shared multi-agent environment? 
And finally, how do you set up multi-agent environments such that they give rise to the emergence of complex behavior as agents continually adapt to each other? So for the purposes of today's talk, I'm gonna focus on these three topics. And before I do that, let me give you a little bit of a background in reinforcement learning, which is a tool that I'm gonna use throughout the talk. So reinforcement learning is a paradigm where you have an agent interacting with an environment over time. And at each time step, the agent is going to perceive the state of the environment S and take an action A. The environment is going to transition to a new state and the agent is going to get a reward. And the goal of the agent is to maximize its discounted future reward. So if we look at the empirical return of the trajectory, what we're doing is summing up all of the rewards that occur across time and applying a discount factor to the time steps farther in the future. So this is what makes RL distinct from other areas of machine learning. You can think of it as sequential decision making. Instead of making a greedy decision or a singular classification decision, the agent is trying to optimize its actions over a sequence of decisions over the entire course of interacting with an environment. And when, uh, we're going to learn a policy in order to, to make those decisions. That's going to give you the probability of taking an action given a state. And an equation you should know is uh, the value estimate. So this is saying over many different experiences interacting with this environment over many episodes, what is the expected value of being in this, this state now and then following my policy thereafter in terms of the rewards I expect to experience over time? And if you know the value of a state, or better yet, the value of a state action pair, then you can um, easily realize which actions are more valuable to take and which states are more valuable to be in. And then I often use deep reinforcement learning, which just means that you're replacing that policy with a deep neural network. But let's dive into this topic of multi-agent coordination. So let's say I wanted to train these robots to coordinate with each other. One method I might use uh, that's very popular in the multi-agent community is centralized training and decentralized execution. And why it's called centralized training is that during training, it's assumed that the agents can share privileged information with each other, like their parameters or their rewards, or they can have a centralized critic. And this is uh, suited if you're training all of the agents that you care about, like if you're in this multi-robot coordination setting. But what if you're in a setting where you have to coordinate with humans, like in autonomous driving? You can't really assume that humans are going to be able to share privileged information like their parameters and their rewards during training. So how do you learn to coordinate with agents when you can't have centralized training? So that's actually the focus of this work. Could you learn a multi-agent coordination method that allows agents to train in a fully decentralized or independent way? So they're not sharing privileged information. And the idea that I had was that if we reward agents for having high mutual information between their actions, this is going to be an inductive bias that drives them towards learning coordinated behavior. And specifically, the way that I implement this is to give agents an intrinsic social motivation, so an extra incentive, to have a causal influence on the actions of other agents. And why this is good is if you are just trying to influence other agents' actions, then you just assume that you can see their actions. So, you know, if I'm the Tesla car trying to train an autonomous vehicle, I might not be able to observe the proprietary rewards or parameters of the Waymo car, but I can observe if that car turns left. So it's more realistic to assume I can see the other agent's actions. So how can I learn to coordinate in that case? So the way we do this is we start with a standard deep reinforcement learning agent, which you just learned is, you know, outputting a policy and a value function. And what we're going to do is augment it with an additional set of layers that are going to be asked to predict the actions of every other agent at the next time step, conditioned on every agent's action at the current time step. And you can just train this model by your experience of interacting with the other agents, you observe what actions they're taking, and you train it with supervised learning. And then using this model, the agent can start asking itself counterfactual questions. So it can plug in an alternative action at a particular time step and ask itself, you know, what do I predict this other agent would do if I had taken this action instead, if I had taken this counterfactual action? And then using that type of counterfactual reasoning, the agent can sample several counterfactual actions and plug them into its predictive model. And by summing over them, basically obtain a marginalized policy of the other agent. So agent B's policy, if it weren't considering agent A. And then the divergence between that marginal policy of agent B and the policy of agent B conditioned on agent A's action is a measure of the causal influence of agent A's action on agent B's action. 
And the way we establish that it's causal is using causal influence diagrams following Pearl's work, which you can check out in the paper if you're interested. But the punchline here is that we're going to give this as a reward to agent A. So agent A is going to get a reward if it takes an action that causes agent B to do something differently. Now, there's a problem with this that you might have noticed. So I'm going to take one more slide and then I'm going to ask for your feedback. What could go wrong if we just give agent A a reward for influencing the actions of another agent? So before I get into that, let me just quickly highlight the connection with mutual information. So you saw the equation for the influence reward is this KL divergence term here. If you check out the equation for the mutual information, you see that they share that same KL divergence term. But of course, computing the mutual information requires summing over the probability of every state, which is computationally intensive and intractable. But of course, as we sample many trajectories from the environment, we're actually sampling those trajectories according to that probability of the state. So in expectation, we're basically making a Monte Carlo estimate of the mutual information. So we're, by maximizing the influence reward, we're going to end up maximizing the mutual information between agents' actions. So a very common intrinsic motivation in RL is called empowerment. And this is asking agents to maximize the mutual information between their actions and their own future state. So you can think of social influence as a novel form of social empowerment that helps agents discover a coordinated policy. But wait. I just said, you know, there could be a problem with asking one agent to have an influence on the action of another agent. Can anybody think of what it might be? One might be one great way to influence someone is to like crash into them. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. So I can influence you in a way that doesn't help you, right? I could crash into you. I could just get in your way. You have to walk around me. I've influenced you, but it doesn't help you. And the issue is that while it is the case that if we're coordinating, we should have high mutual information. So let's say you and I are coordinating to lift a heavy piece of furniture. If you lift the furniture more quick, quickly, then I would have to do so as well. So when we're coordinating, we will have high mutual information. But high mutual information doesn't imply that we're coordinating. You can actually have high mutual information in the case that you're competing. So it isn't necessarily the case that maximizing mutual information will always lead to cooperation. So. Um, in this work, we take two different approaches to address this issue. The first approach is to test in environments where cooperation is exactly the hard thing. So we test in a tragedy of the commons environment. This is this top environment harvest. Agents are trying to eat these delicious green apples. That's how they get a reward. But if they eat the apples too quickly, the apples become depleted. And if they eat all of them, they will never grow back and they'll go hungry. So essentially each agent is greedily motivated to eat more apples, but if they all do that, uh, they, will, they will exhaust this resource. Similarly in cleanup, this is a public goods resource game. So um, the agent is, needs to clean the river uh, in order to make apples appear, but because the environments are partially observed, when it's cleaning the river, it can't see if any apples are appearing as a result of its efforts. And that means it can be easily exploited by the other agents. They can take the apples that it's farming. Now, to make this more concrete, we can establish that these are social dilemmas using these shelling diagrams. So what you're seeing here is the payoff that an individual agent can expect to get if it follows a defecting strategy in red or a cooperating strategy in blue, depending on the number of other agents that are cooperating with it. So over here, we see everyone's cooperating. Over here, no one is cooperating. The reason it's a social dilemma is the payoff for defecting on your fellow little compatriots there is almost always higher. So agents are greedily motivated to defect. But if everyone does that, you can see that the payoff is very, very low. So vanilla RL agents have a really hard time learning this trade-off. Like if you cooperate with me, I'll cooperate with you, I'll make this promise and we'll end up over here. Instead, they often end up over here. But what we can see is that by adding this social influence reward, the agents obtain higher collective payoff which is a measure of how much the group is actually cooperating to solve the social dilemma. And the performance is actually better than previous work, which does allow privileged access to other agents' rewards. But we just said like social influence didn't necessarily have to lead to cooperation. So why did it in this case? So let's take a look at how this is actually working. What you're seeing here, um, in this case, only this purple agent has been trained with the influence reward. So this agent here. And you can see that it behaves a little bit differently than the other agents. When there are no apples, the other agents continue exploring and looking for food. 
but the purple agent actually stays still. And in fact, it only ever moves when there's an apple nearby. So how does that allow it to gain influence over other agents? Well, if we look at this moment of high influence between this purple agent and this yellow agent here, because the environment is partially observed, the yellow agent can only see what's in this red box. This is its field of view over here. So it can't see that there's this delicious green apple just outside of its field of view. But when the purple agent moves, which it only ever does if there's food nearby, this reliably signals to this agent that there must be food outside of its field of view, changing its intended behavior and allowing this purple agent to gain influence. We can see another example of this. So here we see this pink agent has been cleaning the river, but it can't see if any apples have appeared as a result of its efforts. When the influencer agent stays still, that reliably signals there are no apples, changing this agent's intended behavior, and again, allowing this agent to gain influence. So now you can see how this influence reward has actually changed the payoff structure of the game, because by signaling about whether apples are appearing, it can increase the expected payoff for this agent of following this cooperative strategy of cleaning the river. But perhaps more importantly, aside from this specific game, what's interesting is that by you know, incentivizing the agents to gain influence, have influence over each other's actions, they actually learn to communicate or share information with each other in order to gain influence. So they shared information about the presence of food. So of course, what we said is, hey, could we actually train an explicit communication protocol using this influence reward? So the next step we took was to say, okay, here we've got our agent, it's learning a policy, and this policy is just going to be, you know, the action it takes in the environment, that's just going to be trained on the environmental reward. But instead, let's train an explicit communication policy with this influence reward. So this policy is going to learn which of a set of discrete communication symbols to emit and place on a cheap talk communication channel. So every other agent is able to see the message that you send from the previous time step but the agents are not forced to attend to it. They could just ignore the message that's being placed on the channel. And we're gonna give the agents a reward if their communication message influences the action policy of another agent. And this is the second thing we're doing to overcome this problem of whether it influence is always beneficial because we hypothesize that influential communication should always benefit the listener. And that's because the listener's action policy is only trained to maximize its own reward and it's free to ignore the communication message. So the only reason it's going to update its policy as a result of the communication message is if it provides valuable information that helps the listener maximize their own reward. So let's see how this works out. So what we see is that when we add this communication channel and the influence reward, the agents are once again able to obtain higher collective payoff. So this is evidence that they're cooperating more effectively with this influential communication. We also see that the agents are able to learn more meaningful communication protocols. So they're speaking more consistently about the actions they're taking in the environment. And in moments of influence, there's high mutual information between the communication message and the other agent's action. But this is a more interesting result. This is my favorite result. So what you're seeing here is the degree of influence between an influencer agent on the y-axis and an influenced agent on the x-axis. So in this particular environment, it looks like agent zero is easily influenced or heavily influenced by several other agents. We also see that agent zero got higher individual reward in that environment. So this is not a coincidence. Actually, across hundreds of different hyperparameter settings in both environments, we see that agents that are more easily influenced or better listeners, if you will, um, tend to get higher individual reward. So we think this provides evidence to support that hypothesis I mentioned that influential communication is providing valuable information to the listener that helps the listener maximize their own reward. Now, I do wanna mention a couple of discussion points. So whether the action action version of the influence reward is going to lead to cooperation is going to depend on the environment because as you so astutely pointed out, there are ways to influence another agent that are non-cooperative. We think that the reason communication emerged as a result in this environment is that the agents were self-interested. So they're still trying to pick up apples. And if they spent all of their time trying to run into other agents, that's going to be too much of a deviation from the optimal apple picking policy. Um, whereas just sharing information may be a cheap way to gain influence without losing, up, losing too much apple picking time. 
Um, however, influence on selfish or interested agents via the cheap talk communication channel should benefit the listener because the listener is free to ignore the information unless it helps that selfish listener. But this also depends on the agents interacting repeatedly. So if there was some way for me to communicate with an agent that I would never see again, I could potentially lie to gain influence. But of course, if I lied over time, then the listener would learn to ignore me. So I would lose influence. So it depends on the agents interacting repeatedly. So in conclusion, you could think of social influence as a unified method for promoting both coordination and communication in multi-agent settings. And it enables agents to learn socially, but train independently. So unlike prior work, it's a fully decentralized coordination method that doesn't require shared access to other agents' parameters or rewards. All right, so let me pause here. I can take one or two questions. Hi, Natasha, I've got a quick question. Um, so I guess is my, my, my question is, is action, action influence the way that you've described it actually enough? So if you're looking at sort of single actions at the next time step and just influencing that, I mean, you could imagine that the influence or like the message that you're passing to another agent um, you might want that to affect the agent's action like multiple steps in the future, right? Like it's an RL problem. And so um, sort of the entire future uh, trajectory of actions that the agent's taking, you know, are, are maybe a good way to measure sort of your influence. Does that? Yes, it makes sense. sense. So um, in this case, we're uh, measuring your simultaneous influence on the particular step of another agent. You could actually build up a communication message that takes several time steps to complete and then still gain influence if the other agent reacted um, on the final time step of your message. But if the other agent stored that information and changed its policy several time steps later, we would not be able to assess that. So in order to extend this to um, capturing more long-term effects, you could do something like directed information, which is the mutual information between sequences. But that's obviously more computationally expensive to compute. All right, thank you. Let's move on to the next part. So I hope you've seen that you know multi-agent training uh, can solve problems like you know coordinating with other agents. That makes sense. It's a multi-agent problem. But I'd actually like to argue that multi-agent training goes beyond solving multi-agent problems, and it can actually be a useful tool for addressing fundamental issues in AI like learning and generalization. So that's this idea of multi-agent emergent complexity. The intuition here is that if you set up a multi-agent environment, because the agents are constantly adapting to each other, they're constantly providing a series of harder learning problems with your, which your target agent must adapt to. Um, and this can actually create a curriculum of learning problems that drives more interesting and emergent complex behaviors. So let's take a look at how well this idea can work in the context of improving generalization and transfer in DeepRL. So we care about improving generalization in DeepRL. Um, one reason is that we might want to train in simulation because that's cheap and we can make uh, many samples in simulation and transfer to the real world, especially if we're doing robotics. And so one dominant paradigm or very effective method for doing this is to say, okay, I have a simulator. What I'm gonna do is randomize the parameters of my simulator and train on many different random samples of those parameters and hope that I create a broad enough randomized training distribution that I can actually uh, generalize to the real world because the real world is just gonna look like a point within that random distribution. And this has been used effectively, for example, with this robotic hand, but let's see how well that works in this very simple environment. So here, what we have is we're trying to train this little blue agent to walk to this green goal. And we're gonna use domain randomization to randomize the positions of the obstacles um, and the goal. And we're gonna train on many different random instantiations of this. Now let's see how well an agent trained with this training procedure can actually generalize to this four rooms environment. And what you'll see is that the agent actually really struggles to walk around walls, which is kind of curious because walls are within the distribution of things that you could have been sampling randomly. So why is the agent so bad at doing this? Basically, we spent a lot of time training on these unstructured environments that look like the thing on the left and not enough time training on these specific examples that maybe are salient for humans, but the agent is not performing well. So this seems like you know, it's failing in this very simple case. But maybe you're a roboticist and you say, I really believe in domain randomization and I'm gonna use it to try to train a robot to walk up stairs. And so you build a simulator of stairs 
and you randomize parameters like the height, the width, and the texture, and you train your policy and simulation over and over, and you actually succeed in obtaining a policy that can be transferred to the real robot to actually walk up this set of stairs. And you say, fantastic, I'm gonna start a company, we're gonna build autonomous household robots, we're gonna make a billion dollars, and it's gonna be great. And you start your company, and then you try to deploy your robots to all of the stairs in the world. And you run into a little issue. The problem is the real world has a lot of diversity. And I really doubt that you thought to build this diagonal set of stairs into your simulation. So the idea that everything you might want to transfer to in the real world just looks like a different instantiation of a few set of parameters that you thought to build into your simulator, to me, is just untenable. So I think what we need is a set of complex training environments that are going to cover unknown real world challenges that we need to transfer to, but we don't wanna to have to program all of those into the simulator ourselves by hand, because this is just gonna be brittle. We're gonna miss stuff. Uh, I don't think this is the right approach. So wait, okay, we're talking about robustness. We wanna make our agent more robust. Maybe we should think about adversarial robustness. So what if we actually learn a second policy and it's actually gonna learn how to set the parameters of our environment or our simulator in order to minimize the performance of the agent that we're trying to train. So we're gonna have this mini max environment generating policy. Can anyone see what might go wrong with this approach? It can be impossible to kind of reach the goal. Right? Yes, it can be impossible to reach the goal, which is exactly what you see in this video. So here an adversary has constructed an environment to minimize the performance of the agent it's actually completely succeeded in its task. The agent has no path to the goal, but of course this provides no learning opportunity for our agent. So again, we're just wasting training time and we're not getting a robust agent. So what prior work that has used adversaries in DeepRL has done is to say, okay, you know, if I'm an adversary that's applying forces in Swimmer, then I'm just gonna hand tune some constraints on the adversary saying that it can't apply more than, you know, X force in Swimmer and Y force in Walker. And so this prevents the adversary from being overpowered, but again, we're spending a lot of time hand engineering for each new domain. So I asked myself, is there a more elegant way to constrain that adversary to ensure that it doesn't create impossible environments? And wouldn't it be great if we could tailor the environments to the current skill level of the agent so that we're getting this nice automatic curriculum and we're not wasting training, thing, training time on examples that are too easy or too hard? And so I said at the beginning that, you know, multi-agent environments are well suited to generating a nice curriculum of training tasks. Maybe we just need to make this a little bit more multi-agent. So that's actually the idea behind this algorithm here. So we're going to have an adversary. It's going to be generating an environment. Instead of uh, having a single player play that environment, we're going to constrain the adversary using the performance of a second agent that plays the same environment. So we're going to take our player, rename it a protagonist, and introduce the second agent, the antagonist. And then the adversary is going to maximize the difference between them. So what this is doing is asking the adversary to build environments that are possible because at least the antagonist can do a good job, but they're still challenging and for the protagonist. And specifically they exploit weaknesses in the protagonist policy in order to make it more robust. So we call our approach protagonist antagonist induced regret environment design, which is a bit of a mouthful, but paired is describing how we're using this pair of agents. Now, the reason I called it uh, induced regret environment design is because as we show in the paper, if you assume that the adversary and the antagonist are coordinating, then this becomes a two player zero sum game. And if that game reaches a Nash equilibrium, we can show that the protagonist will be playing the mini max regret policy, meaning it's minimizing its worst case difference between itself and the optimal policy in any environment. And so this is a nice objective for robustness because it's going to learn to succeed at any environment where it's possible to succeed. And uh, we can also show that each of the methods that I've discussed so far connect back to the decision theory or decision making under uncertainty literature. So you can think of domain randomization as equivalent to the principle of insufficient reason, the minimax adversary as the maximin principle, and paired is doing minimax regret. And the way we can show this is by introducing a new formalism called unsupervised environment design. So basically, instead of thinking about a normal POMDP, now we wanna think about an underspecified POMDP. So you can think of the underspecified POMDP as sort of the space of all possible grid worlds. And then we introduce a new set of parameters theta, which take our underspecified POMDP 
to a specific instantiation of a POM BP by specifying the parameters of, for example, the actual block positions in a grid world. And then by reasoning about how to define a policy over those parameters, you can actually recover each of the methods that I mentioned. So domain randomization, the minimax method, and paired. But let me give you a little more context on the paired algorithm. So the way this actually works is we're going to randomly initialize all of these agents. We're then going to, until convergence, have the adversary generate a new environment with parameters theta and have the protagonist and antagonist each collect several trajectories in that environment. And why we're doing that is to give us a little bit more stable estimate of the regret, where we can make the antagonist look a little bit more like the optimal policy by taking the max over the trajectories that it executes. And then we just take the mean of the protagonist trajectories. So this gives us a signal that looks a little bit more like um, environments where it's possible to do well, but they're still very challenging on average. And then we have the adversary maximize this signal and the protagonist and antagonist are going to maximize just their environment reward. So they're just a normal RL agent. And the nice thing about this regret objective is it actually lends itself very well to generating an automatic curriculum. So I'm gonna to claim to you that regret is incentivizing the adversary to create the easiest possible environment that the protagonist cannot yet solve. And this is true with a very simple assumption that the reward of solving an environment in fewer time steps is going to be higher, which is true of many different RL problems. So in that case, let's look at this regret signal. Let's say the adversary is succeeding in minimizing the performance of the protagonist. So this second term is actually just going to zero. Then in order to maximize the regret, the adversary just has to maximize the antagonist performance. And we know that the antagonist performance is going to be higher if it can complete the environment in fewer time steps. So it's actually very intuitive. Your regret of failing to do an easy environment is going to be higher than your regret of failing to do a hard environment. So the adversary is always searching for the easiest environment where the protagonist is not able to solve it. And so what this is doing is essentially incentivizing the adversary to uh, propose tasks in the protagonist zone of proximal development. So essentially tasks that it can't do quite yet, but it could with a little bit more training. So that's what's giving rise to this nice curriculum property. And we do see this emerging in the results. So what we're looking at here, let's take for example, the passable path length. So this is gonna be the shortest path between the start state and the goal state in a given maze that's being generated. And it's gonna be zero if that maze is impossible. So we saw that our minimax method is driving this uh, metric towards zero, as we would expect. And the paired method is continuing to generate more complex environments. And the agents are actually responding by solving the increasingly complex environments. But what's interesting about this is that at no point were, were the adversary or the agents actually trained on path length as a metric. This is just a property that emerged from the training procedure. So let's take a look at what these environments actually look like. As we saw, domain randomization generates these unstructured environments. Um, they're not tailored to the agent's skill level during training. The minimax adversary can just create impossible environments, but paired is like our Goldilocks. It's generating structured environments that are challenging. There's a very long path here to the goal. They're still possible to solve. And that property is very nice because what we actually wanna do here is improve generalization. So the way we test that in this work is looking at zero shot transfer to a set of challenging test environments. And what we see is that as the environments become more complex, the performance gap between paired and the baseline techniques widens. And for the extremely complex environments, only paired is having any hope of solving them. Um, so we think this is a promising approach for improving generalization. And in fact, it was promising enough that we actually worked with a Google product team to deploy this to Google Assistant. So Google would really like it if you could say, okay, Google, go buy me a keyboard or okay, Google, go book me a flight to Los Angeles leaving on Friday. And you could have an agent that would actually complete the sequential decision-making task of navigating through those websites, plugging in for your information and completing that task. But this is a very hard problem, not only because of the complexity of the task, but because you really need generalization to get this to work, right? So imagine that you wanna train this flight booking agent and you scrape all of Delta's website and you train an agent that works perfectly on the current version of Delta's website, you know, what happens if Delta updates their website? If you're not able to generalize at all, what is your system just gonna go down until you can re-scrape and retrain? If you want something that works on the internet, you need some level of generalization. 
So that's important. The other problem is that it's just a really hard task. So when we were introduced to the team, the approach they were taking was to hand program a curriculum of easy, medium, and harder websites. And what you see is that for the hardest websites, the agents are not even able to solve the task. So we said, hey, could we develop an approach based on paired where we actually construct an adversary that is able to build practice websites out of a series of pages and web elements? And we can use that to train a better web navigation agent. And we did that. And so what you actually see here is these websites were constructed by our adversary. And we actually saw that a curriculum emerged over the course of training. So early in training, the adversary is building um, many pages with very few elements per page. So on each page, it's the task of deciding what the agent should do is much simpler. However, later in training, the adversary is placing many elements on a single page, making the task of figuring out what to do much more complex. And we didn't anticipate that this property is the right way to think about difficulty, but this is something that emerged from the training procedure. We then tested the resulting agents on a series of web navigation benchmarks. So an existing web navigation benchmark, a new benchmark that we propose that's harder, and real websites. And what we saw is that on the benchmark tasks, our method is four times more successful than the state-of-the-art prior work. And it reaches more than 95% task success across all difficulty levels, which is what necessitates getting a harder benchmark. We then actually tested our agents on real websites, and we saw very promising initial results on the tasks that we started with. So this is actively under investigation as a way to improve Google Assistant. So in conclusion, multi-agent training can be an effective way to improve learning and generalization. And we think paired is a good approach for doing this because it's incentivizing this adversary to build feasible yet challenging environments that are making the protagonist more robust. And this regret objective lends itself nicely to not only making robust agents, but creating an automatic curriculum. All right, so let me pause here and take a couple more questions if you're interested. Could you maybe say something about the like the sampling distributions for um, yeah for the adversary how how it's kind of initialized how broad it has to be and how it's exactly adapted yeah so that's actually um a key thing what you should do is try to parameterize your adversary so that as when it's initialized with a random policy a sample from that policy looks like a domain randomization environment so like the parameterization, you have to be a little bit careful because if initial samples from the brand and policy are always impossible, it becomes a much harder learning problem. But if it starts that a random sample looks like an environment the agent has a chance of solving, then it can learn which environments are more or less challenging. And the only way that it learns is actually through the feedback it gets in terms of the regret signal. So it constructs a whole environment and then gets the sparse reward of what is the regret. Got it, thanks. Yes, I see another question. Yeah, really fascinating stuff. I think the, the web page example is probably a good example to ask about how you sort of pick the level of abstraction or just kind of the API for doing this kind of learning, right? I can think of a web page as a grid of pixels or as a collection of HTML, right? And I'm gonna learn very different things based on those choices. Yeah, in this case, we thought about DOM elements and we actually give the adversary um, web primitives that are constructed out of DOM elements. So it can add, for example, a login bar or a submit button. So it kind of has primitive structures that it can use to construct a series of web pages. But um, it was flexible enough that we can construct some thousands and thousands of web pages. I forget the exact number, but it's a very broad space. All right, I'm gonna move on to the last part of the talk. If you have deeper questions, I'm happy to take them at the end. All right, so returning to this idea of the human AI side of my work, I'm really interested in making agents that are able to coordinate effectively with humans to assist them with tasks. So if you wanna assist a human with a task, I think it would make a lot of sense if you could learn from the natural signals that you get during that interaction. So for example, you know, I'm sure we've all had the experience where we gave a command to our Alexa or our Siri and just did absolutely the wrong thing. And I would bet you that the next way that we respond contains some hint that we were actually frustrated with that response, that it wasn't the right response that we wanted. So wouldn't it be great if that device could learn from that signal not to take that action again, that something went wrong. But in reality, the way we interact with our AI systems often looks a little bit more like this, where we're filling out these manual cards to indicate our, our preferences. 
But in contrast, this social feedback in terms of our body language, our gestures, our tone of voice, it's rich, ubiquitous, and natural. So you're giving this signal for free. When you're talking to Alexa, you have a tone of voice. Um, so it could be picking up on these signals and using it to learn more effectively. And this is actually something that I was able to validate in some earlier work. So um, I wanted to train a dialogue model that could learn from actually having real conversations with humans. And I had the intuition, for example, that you know, if a human says something that like that didn't make sense, we can detect a negative sentiment and use that as a signal to train the model that the conversation isn't going well. Or when the conversation is going well, the positive sentiment can again serve as a positive reward to help train the model. And so we did this whole project on training such dialogue models with offline RL, et cetera. And we included in this interface, the ability for people to provide manual upvotes and downvotes on the specific responses to give us sort of a ground truth of what did they really prefer in terms of responses. And we encouraged users to do this, but we hypothesized that they're not gonna want to, right? Because deviating, like in order to provide that signal, you have to deviate too much from the natural interaction of having a conversation. And so it's too expensive for the human to provide and thus the signal is gonna be too sparse. And that is what we found. So we found that if you train on these types of manual preference clicking, um, that doesn't work as well as training on these implicit cues, for example, like the sentiment of the user. Um, so in this work, we were able to validate that relying on these implicit social signals can actually work more effectively than relying on manual button presses. But of course, in order to learn from those social cues or those affective cues, you actually need to accurately recognize them first. And so that's what I'd like to talk about for this last part of the talk. So this is going back to some of my earlier work in my PhD. I spent my PhD in the affective computing group and our focus is on using machine learning to predict human emotional and social signals. This has applications to healthcare and mental health. So I'm gonna talk about uh, a series of work that we did on this topic. So what we wanted to do was predict people's real world emotion and well-being signals um, by gathering data unobtrusively from the sensors that you might wear every day doing some super cool machine learning on it, and then giving you a personalized prediction of, you know, there's a 92% chance that you're going to be stressed out tomorrow, maybe because you're giving a job talk, for example. And the idea was that, you know, if you had such a prediction, you could make some adjustments, like maybe get some extra sleep. But the more profound use case is actually, if we could do this type of long-term mental health monitoring, um, we could help people, uh, pr help prevent people from transitioning into a depressed state. So basically the idea is that you can model both healthy functioning and depression as different stable states of a dynamical system. So if you're healthy and something bad happens, you get perturbed, you tend to snap back to going back to your regular healthy state. But if for whatever reason you're perturbed enough or something else happens, you can transition into the depressed equilibrium. And from there, you know, even if something good happens, again, you sink back to that depressed equilibrium that can be difficult to escape from. So if you could do this type of long-term monitoring, you could actually detect people before they transition into this depressed state and, and help um, address people's mental health. So this is the idea behind this goal, um, behind this research. In service of that goal, we collected this big data set, uh, very rich data from hundreds of people. So we collected rich signals about their physiology in terms of their electrodermal activity, their skin temperature, we had um, data from their phones. Who were they texting? When were they using their screen? We scraped the weather. We asked them to report, were they drinking caffeine? Were they drinking alcohol? We had all of this rich data. And we wrote many papers on trying to predict people's mood, stress, and health from this data. We even built whole open source online tools to help you detect artifacts in the data and remove the artifacts and detect peaks that were modulated by the temperature and the movement. Um, but, you know, in our initial classification results, using all of this rich data, we actually saw pretty poor accuracy in predicting people's moods. So we're getting like 68% here. To me, this looks a little bit more like a horoscope than a valid medical uh, device, right? So it's not something that people could trust. And I swear it's not just that, you know, we were bad at our jobs. It's actually very typical of the literature in detecting these types of affective outcomes. So. I asked myself, you know, why aren't we doing better? It isn't that in this case, we didn't collect rich data. You know, what, what's going wrong here? And the answer that I came up with is these models, a generic machine learning model is not accounting for individual differences. 
So people can react in the exact opposite way to the same stimuli. So for one person, you know, staying at home coding on a Friday night may make them feel very happy and being in a crowded party might do the opposite. But for another person, they might react in completely opposite ways. So if you're lumping everyone into the same classifier and making the same predictions based on a feature of like, did you stay at home coding, you're not going to get accurate results. So the idea here is to use multitask learning to personalize machine learning models to the individual. So by treating predicting the mood of a particular person as a task, you can customize the machine learning model to the individual. But because you know, it's a healthcare application, we don't actually have enough data to train an individual model per person. Data is very scarce. So we still need to benefit from the data of other people um, and gain some statistical strength that way, but only to the degree that those other people's data is actually related to us. So we developed three different multitask learning methods to do this. Um, the first is a neural network-based approach where we have shared feature extraction layers common to everyone. And then we cluster people based on pre-existing characteristics like their big five personality and learn personalized weights for each cluster. We then use a hierarchical Bayesian method that actually learns a non-parametric soft clustering that emerges from the data. And what it's gonna do is actually cluster people together that have similar decision boundaries. So depending on how you feel about you know, loud crowded parties, you're gonna be clustered with other people who feel the same way. And finally, we use a multitask multi-kernel learning method where we're learning personalized weights over these different input modalities. So how much weight should be placed on the weather versus other features. And what we see is that if we look at the um, single task learning version of each of these methods, Again, we see that the accuracy is not that impressive. So we're getting 62 to 68%. If we use those same methods to do multitask learning, but where the different tasks are each of these different outcomes. So uh, the multiple tasks are predicting mood, stress, and health, but everyone is still lumped into the same classifier. We do see some small performance gains, but not really significant. So it's not just that these methods are more fancy or interesting and that's what's getting us performance gains. But when we use multitask learning to personalize the models to the individual, we see very large performance gains. So sometimes up to 23%. And at the time these results were published, this was state of the art performance in predicting these outcomes. So we see big benefits from personalization. <clears throat> and if we dive into why, we can actually gain some really interesting insights into the population that we're training these models on. So here, what you're seeing is um, the how personalized the model uh, learn to make the weights of the different kernel learning classifiers. So in the case of predicting stress, you know, these are all stressed out students from a particular institution. Um, and we see that the model learns to not personalize very much. Everyone is reacting in similar ways to uh, in terms of their stress. But in the case of predicting people's mood, we see that it's very personalized. So for one person, the weather is almost entirely predictive of their mood. And for another person, the weather does not matter at all. So we see this importance of personalization because people are reacting in very different ways to these different um, sensors. This is perhaps a more interesting result. So what you're seeing here is the clusters that emerge from this hierarchical Bayesian model. And so the uh, first cluster is sort of your average student. Uh, this is in predicting stress, by the way. This student doesn't, these students don't differ significantly from the group in any way. The second cluster, this cluster one, uh, has significantly higher GPA and higher conscientiousness. So conscientiousness is like being organized on time. You can think of this as the studious cluster. The third cluster is significantly more extroverted and has lower physical health. So I don't know what extroverted undergrads are doing that lowers their physical health, but you know, you can make some guesses. Um, if we look at cluster one, this studious cluster, it's also interesting that they place a very high weight on the likelihood of the day as making them less stressed out. So they like routine. This is gonna make them feel less stressed. But what's interesting is if we look at um, the similar features that are shared across both clusters, for the extroverts, if they spend a lot of time on campus and they text a lot of people, especially late at night, that's actually associated with them feeling much less stressed out. So these are these are, positively predictive of a low stress day. In contrast, the studious cluster for the exact same features reacts in the exact opposite way. If they spend a lot of time on campus and text a lot of people, they're gonna feel much more stressed. So again, you see this importance of doing personalization. If you lumped everyone into the same model and use these same features, you would not get accurate predictions. 
So we extended this to predicting continuous stress labels with Gaussian processes. Again, we saw that personalized models perform better for the majority of participants. And we saw very significant performance gains in terms of the model fit. So the interclass correlation is not only measuring the mean absolute error from uh, each person's prediction, but also whether it fits the trend of the data. And we see very large gains here. So in conclusion, there's a large degree of heterogeneity in people's affective signals, and you can use personalized multitask learning to customize models to the individual, but still retain statistical strength from other people to the degree that it's relevant. All right, so I'm just going to mention the future work that I'm interested in doing, and then I'll take questions at the end. So to give you a broad overview of the future work I'm interested in, um, I'm really excited about the kind of application where I can enable an assistant that could be in the same environment as a human, coordinating with them with very little data, inferring their preferences in order to assist them, meet the, uh, assist them in meeting those preferences, and following their natural language commands, because this is a very natural way for a human to communicate their preferences to an agent. So diving into this language idea, wouldn't it be cool if you could have RL agents that could be able to follow your natural language commands? And this is not only a really great way for humans to express their preferences to an agent, but I think there could actually be something about language that unlocks progress for RL. For example, um, we know that language is compositional, so maybe this can improve generalization for RL agents. And we've actually seen this in the literature, right? If an agent has trained on pick up the red spoon and pick up the blue cup, it's able to generalize to picking up the blue spoon at test time because of this compositional nature of language. And another motivation here is just that, you know, quite honestly, there's been a lot of progress in large language models lately. So I'd like to ask, you know, what does that unlock for RL? What new abilities can RL agents gain by leveraging large language models? And then the second question I'd like to ask is, what can RL do for lang large language models? There may be objectives, non-differentiable metrics uh, that we want to have a large language model maximize. So if you think about generating code, you probably care about um, training the, the language models to optimize for whether the code compiles and it completes the goal that you were trying to complete. But if you think about just language in general, what is the right objective for language? To me, I think about it as communication. Language is successful if you know I can successfully communicate information to a listener that understands me. So how do you evaluate whether communication was successful? Maybe you can use a multi-agent training protocol. So what I'm excited about doing here is saying, if you have a large language model that can generate instructions, you can validate whether those instructions are comprehensible by having a population of RL agents try to execute those instructions and use the performance that they generate to actually train that language model to generate more comprehensible instructions. And then if you train the language model using a curriculum objective like paired, you can actually uh, generate a curriculum of, ta of tasks where they're posed in natural language and do that in a way that makes your agents more robust to following different natural language commands. So just to illustrate that this is something I feel prepared to do, I do have several pieces of prior work that are on training language models with RL. And I've just started to work on this problem of vision and language navigation, where you're trying to train an RL agent to follow a large paragraph of natural language instructions by navigating a visually realistic environment. So that would be something I would be very excited to collaborate on um, in the future. I'm also excited about trying to infer the preferences that a human is uh, that a human has in order to be able to assist them in meeting those preferences. So, for example, using inverse reinforcement learning. Now, inverse reinforcement learning is a hard problem. Um, there are many different reward functions that can be consistent with a human's behaviors, but I hypothesize that humans are good at this because we have a lot of experience interacting with the world. So what if we can give the same type of experience to an RL agent, perhaps using multitask, multi-agent pre-training? So by training on multiple different tasks, the agent builds up a prior with the space of reasonable goals it can use to infer a human's goal. And using multi-agent pre-training, it's experience coordinating with other agents. And finally, few shot coordination. I wanna solve the problem of coordinating with humans, but humans are very diverse. If you were the little agent trying to play softball with all of these different humans, you would have to be able to adapt to many different play styles. And when you're working with humans, collecting a lot of data from each new human is too expensive. So perhaps you can use multi-agent simulation as a way to build up a reasonable policy that's robust to the choice of coordination partners. So it can easily coordinate with any human. 
All right, so just to reiterate, social reinforcement learning can help improve coordination with other agents, human AI interaction, and finally make progress on fundamental issues like learning and generalization. So I'll pause there and I'm happy to take questions. I think uh, Magda raised her hand. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, really exciting talk, Natasha. This is just such, such cool uh, uh, work. Uh, so I have a question. I'm not sure if it's kind of really well articulated yet. Um, uh, so kind of for some of the work that you were showing us kind of here at the end, but right, we can definitely kind of cluster people uh, kind of along these different dimensions based on, on kind of the main factors that influence them. And then I was thinking about your broader work uh, kind of in this robot, like right, kind of agent human interaction, because mm -hmm. one of the challenges is that I can kind of cluster humans, kind of maybe they react differently to certain factors, but then they're also going to have different ways of interacting. So like kind of in one of your uh, pictures, when you point like the way I want to interact with the robot might be very different. And then I can cluster differently with people and then it might end up kind of like, a, so just kind of wondering how uh, kind of does it end up being like a really multidimensional space? Does it, I don't know, is it just simple and you just kind of expand to that kind of um, to take into account these different characteristics I, as we build more of this um, less of kind of task specific experiments, but maybe more kind of real world experiments where we can interact uh, in kind of very rich ways with these uh, robots in our environment. Yeah, great question. And I would absolutely like to unite these two um, research directions, thinking about personalization in the context of actually coordinating with another agent. So one way to do that is actually to have the agent kind of learn a model of all of the different clusters that exist in a population of agents that it's played with during training. So it can maybe learn um, a way to embed another agent's policy into an embedding space. And then it can, for example, condition on that embedding when it's trying to adapt. So it kind of knows, hey, this is this type of agent that I'm trying to coordinate with. And therefore, I know how to coordinate with it more effectively. So yeah, I think bringing those two threads together is a very promising direction. Okay, thank you. So I think Prithvi Raj had a question from a little while ago. Um, he says, this seems like a good approach in environments that explicitly reward agents for cooperation. What do you think these kinds of motivation will do in environments that require a mix of competition and cooperation? Um, this is with regards to the first part of your talk. Yeah, I'm really excited to explore that in future work. Um, obviously for the, the story of how social learning emerged in humans, um, intergroup competition was a big part of that. So environments that require both competition and cooperation could be a really rich setting to study actually more effective ways of inducing cooperation. Like you really need to learn to cooperate with your team if you have to compete against another team. Do you, do you think these methods could be applied to, you know, automated systems for helping humans to learn? Um, you know, the, the idea of finding the, uh, the, the, the level that is uh, right and optimal for learning seems like you could imagine maybe uh, being applied to human learning somehow, but I was wondering if you thought about that. Yeah, I, I have thought about that a little bit. Um, so in the web navigation work, the, what we actually do is we generate the curriculum using a population of agents where we the regret signal we compute is the max of the population minus the mean. I don't know if that's exactly the right objective for classrooms, because I think if you're just finding like at least one student understood me, but on average they were confused, I think that's maybe the wrong objective, but maybe something inspired by that, where you think about different percentiles, where um, some of the students are getting it, some of the students are challenged, maybe you're hitting the right point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. That, that was excellent. Um, I had a question in terms of uh, your example with the website and how you had the agent that was generating this curriculum. I imagine there's a lot of collaboration and coordination with experts in the field of web development in this case, but maybe as you are like trying to take into account large language models and different tasks, could you talk a little bit about that process, right? Like how do you collaborate and also first, um, Kind of identify like what are these like lower hanging fruits in terms of domains where you could apply this approach and figure out what primitives you are handling and how you encode them into your system. Thank that's you. a great that's a great question. Yeah, so I was fortunate in that um, in collaborating with the web navigation team, there was a con 
significant contingent of people that care about that problem for Google Assistant and have a lot of domain expertise. So I think like if you're doing applications like that, it's really beneficial to collaborate with domain experts who really understand the problem that you're trying to do. And you can bring kind of like the algorithmic expertise and, you know, they say, oh, we have this specific requirement, like it needs to generalize in this way, or it needs to learn long horizon planning. And you can say, well, these are things we can do to help improve the generalization or the planning or something like that. So um, that's been an approach that has been successful for me in the past. Um, one question, Natasha, is if you deploy, let's say you're trying to have an assistive robot in somebody's home and you want to train it with RL in their home, you deploy it, but it kind of, it's not that good to start, so it's maybe quite incompetent. Um, <laughs> have you like considered how you would actually train these kinds of agents and not have them be turned off? Because like an issue is if you deploy an incompetent robot in an environment, I'd just turn it off, right? Yeah, or it could even be unsafe, right? So right. the approach I've always taken is you don't, I don't think the social RL part is what you start with from scratch, right? Like in the example of learning dialogue, it would be total madness to try to learn language from scratch by collecting a few human conversations and starting with babbling and just hoping that their sentiment is gonna give you enough signal to learn language, right? So you first pre-train as reasonable of a policy that you can get. So it's has some level of ability to interact with the human in a useful way or an interesting way. And that's when you can start getting these signals. But if your robot is totally useless from day one, I think that that would be very challenging to learn from scratch with this human feedback. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I had a quick uh, question about the, um, you know, the social learning aspect um, in terms of model-based versus model-free approaches. Um, so. I've seen some work being done uh, on using Palm DPs, you know, for modeling theory of mind. Um, yeah. So I'm just wondering, what is the relationship you see in terms of what you've done uh, in terms of multi-agent social learning versus some of these other approaches that explicitly model this notion of theory of mind from psychology? So actually, if you're thinking about like the OCC model of emotions encoded as a Palm DP, that was like my master's advisor, Christina Conati. So definitely familiar with those approaches and think they're cool. Um, in my own work, in, especially in multi-agent RL, I found a lot of success in doing explicit models of the other agents. So obviously the social influence work depends on first building up a reasonable model of other agents. And in this work, the sci-fi learning, we um, model every other agent's policy in terms of successor features and a successor representation. And what that allows us to do is sort of selectively imitate from other agents when we compute that imitating them would actually pay off under our own reward function. So instead of just indiscriminately imitating, you're doing social learning in the sense of you're learning who to imitate because you predict it would actually pay off. Um, so yeah, I think modeling definitely has a role to play here, especially modeling other agents is important. Right, thank you. Let's um, thank the speaker then. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll have Natasha join us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it.